And so what do I do now? So, um, so then we get started from there, right? So the, the next two things that I'm gonna be sharing are things that you can do on your own. I'm gonna tell it to you how you can start getting started with those. So the first thing is, keeping something that I call a win list. I feel based on the previous call and also even when I talk with my clients one-on-one, -on -one, they have never heard this concept before. And so I am trying to just get it out there as much as I can. And so the keeping a win list, a win list is just a document. It can be a digital document. It can be a document that you have on your notebook where you are actually ideally on a daily basis, you are, you are kind of writing and celebrating yourselves for the wins that you are achieving that day or that hour or whatever moment that you're, that you're going on in. And that it just allows us to celebrate again, the big and the small ones that are happening in our lives. So it can be learning how you're growing. It can be maybe like a shift that you notice how you're showing up at work or even outside of work as well. And then you're celebrating that. And um, the main reason why at the beginning of this, of this exercise, I have to say, I've noticed that a lot of people have a hard time coming up with a win because they, again, they're starting, they haven't reframed the way that they think about it. They keep thinking it has to be something big. I haven't landed a large client or I haven't closed a really big deal. So what am I supposed to put in this list? So like, again, just keep going back to that reframe um, of it comes in all shapes and sizes. And I can also celebrate learning. I can also celebrate just, you know, a shift that I've noticed. So some of the examples that I have for this could be something like, oh, today I spoke up in a meeting. That could be one, right? Like maybe you haven't spoken up before and today you just had the courage and you did it. That is a huge win. That is a shift that you can replicate later for you to start like leveling up a little bit more in your role. The, the Another one could be a little bit even more, um, a little bit less intense, right? It can be today I created a personal boundary to make sure that I'm leaving before five, um, a little bit before 5 p.m and not working a little bit and not working more than that. So you see, these are all different learning, different shifts, different ways that you're growing that we are gonna be keeping a list of. And like I said, this is a practice, kind of like if a lot of do, if a lot of you do yoga, you know that it's just a practice. You just are not expert at yoga, right? Like it takes a little bit of time, but it also takes those small steps. And this is what I do first to kind of like set up that foundation really strongly before you even start getting into the conversation with managers and so on, especially if you haven't not done it before, it's especially for you to celebrate yourself first, for you to be able to expect others to celebrate or acknowledge your wins as well. It's just a lot easier. And the way that I think about it is that by doing this win list, you just get sold on your amazing experience and you do get sold on your own accomplishments. And so it's a lot easier to sell after that. So that is a win list. And the second thing is, because I know a lot of people are going to be like, okay, I do all these random things. And then how do I bring it up to like people who are not understanding my journey and so on. So now I have a second part to this, which is a little bit more target, targeted to your role. So um, this is a second list and it is more so around the goals that you have as a part of that team that you're in. So um, the second thing is going to be identifying themes around your specific role. We all are in different roles here or have been. And so we wanna make sure that we understand what are, out of all the activities that we're taking on a very on an, on every single day, they all fall into a certain theme because we're doing some repetitive work, maybe we're doing working towards a specific project. So I want you to start thinking, what are those themes for you? They can be projects that you're working on. Maybe you're a project manager and you just have four for the year or something. Maybe you're a program manager and you have just a few programs to manage. Maybe you have already, you have started a role and it's main responsibilities for now. Or maybe your manager has already outlined clear expectations from you. That is another goal, okay? So these are the themes or pillars are it's really things that don't change that often. So you just wanna identify what those are. And just to give you a quick example, for me, for example, as a program manager, I noticed that a lot of the tasks that I was doing were falling on three different themes or pillars. And one of them was, okay, I'm managing the budget of this program. Uh, the second one is I had a technical expectation of launching features. So there's something that my manager expressed to me. So that was one of the major things I was doing every day. And then the third thing is 
um, being a point of contact. So communication was a big part of my role. And so those were my three themes. And so what I would do later is that once I have identified the themes for my role, then I can leverage any sort of piece of technology, which could be like GitLab, it could be uh, Google Docs, Hive Docs, which I, I need to share that eventually. I didn't share it in the previous one because those are things that are gonna allow us to keep track of wins around those themes, okay? So normally, so for example, if one day you achieve something, around, maybe one of your themes is communication. In one of those days, maybe you were able to communicate to a director and you successfully kind of like, you know, got them into believing in your project or something. Uh, and thank you, Samantha, for the, for the link. Um, so let's say that you were able to communicate that clearly. That is a win, and that will go under point of contact, under one of your pillars, right? And you have to be able to identify what pillar that is for you. And the whole idea for having the second list is so it's visible to you first before it's visible to others, right? And that is the first kind of step of this journey into more confidently talking about your accomplishments is really allowing yourself to celebrate, like I said, those wins, allow those wins to be in paper or on paper or like in a, in a digital place for it to be visible for you first, you're really getting used to that feeling before it's visible to others or before you get out in like a big meeting and you talk about it, right? So this really helps set the foundation there. So those are the, the things that I have on, on accomplishments. That's great, Michelle, thank you. Um, I'll ask the second question. So once we like, have these lists and we've like started practicing, uh, you know, really celebrating our accomplishments for ourselves, I'm wondering, can you share some strategies for how we can talk about and share these accomplishments with our colleagues, especially since at GitLab, we're working all remotely? Yeah, of course. So um, in general, I have to say that whether it's in person or in all remote, it all comes down to visibility. So I know that we always talk about visibility in tech and it's something that everyone likes to say, but no one ever tells us how to effectively do that, right? Like, I just don't think ever in my six years of at Amazon, ever, and no one told me how to actually be visible without them telling me like, oh, like, just, just be visible. You know, it's like, it's almost like we should know what it is, but no one knows what it is. So, so what I'm gonna be talking about today in terms of, making sure to put those accomplishments and really share those with our colleagues is going to be this idea that I have of effective visibility, which is a communicate, which is a combination of the first thing, which is a high, um, the act of highlighting your insights, your wins, your accomplishments. The second thing is choosing the right place to, or the right space to share it. Um, and that space could be a meeting, could be a one-on-one, -on -one, could be an internal conference, task management tools and even emails. And then the third thing would be the applicability to the person that you're speaking to. In other, in other words, the common ground that you have with that person, maybe that person is your manager. Maybe that person is your colleague or someone who worked in a specific uh, project with you, right? And using these three factors, you can really come up with a custom strategy. And the main reason I advocate for actually having a custom strategy is because I know that this type of work is already really hard on us. It has to feel easy for us to do it more often and for us to start then creating that visibility, right? So I make sure that when you're doing this, you're choosing the place that is actually, that feels safest to you, right? And that is gonna depend on your personality because if it doesn't feel easy, it's just kind of like gonna be information that you have and you won't be able to apply it. So um, if you're someone a little bit more extrovert, for example, you can choose a place to be in a one-on-one -on -one or in a big conference or when you're doing, you know, the stand-up meetings with your team. If you're someone who's a little bit let on the on the more shy side, you can send an email or you can agree with your manager to make, or with your colleagues and so on to send each other updates or like status updates, right? Where you get to celebrate yourself as well. So those are the things that you just have to consider as you're creating your own strategy. So I'm gonna give you the example of me creating my own strategy just based on my own personality and so on. That way you are able to create your own on your own terms. So um, the first thing, let's say that the example that I have is, okay, let's say that you completed a, a task in relation to a bigger project, right? Where more, multiple people were involved. And your role in all of this was that you completed the task or your achievement in this was that you completed a task 
24 hours before the deadline, okay? And so now the next thing, um, this is where a lot of people get stuck. Like after the second one, it's like, okay, I did that and it's amazing and I wanna talk about it, but how do I do the talk about it, right? So the, the other two steps are the how. And so the, ne the next step is kind of like seeing, okay, like what is the space where I feel the safest or maybe where it's a place where I can get started sharing these type of things without me feeling that I'm going too much out of my comfort zone that I'm super scared that I won't take action, but also challenging myself a little bit to start growing into this kind of like new version. So choose a place for you. So for me, knowing my, my personality, I'm a little bit more of an extrovert. So I know that I would go into a one-on-one -on -one meeting or I would even do it in the stand-up meeting when everyone is giving their updates and just speak about it, right? And then if you're someone again on the shy side, you can just do an email no, for example and that is also and then the second kind of like filter that you put in, in in terms of the how is who is the person that you're communicating this to and for which and for what goal and a lot of the time it's going to be our manager or a lot of times it's going to be someone who worked with us who potentially will have an opportunity to or a say in us getting promoted or something so you can just then decide okay like how do I communicate this to this specific person if it's someone who worked with you in that project then you can just be like a quick email, right? Even a quick summary about the things that you accomplished or even just sending a quick Slack, right? Or like a message, I don't know what internal messaging service you have. And then just starting have it, being willing to and open to have those conversations. But again, this all, the two second parts, like who is this communicating to and then the right space for you, that has to be something that feels good to you for you to be able to take that action. And, um, and so something that I wanted to mention as well is that a lot of people I feel, I know that I was guilty of this as well. When I was trying to share something that maybe I felt that it was too personal or like maybe I felt that it was only me who achieved this and maybe there was no, there was no impact or direct impact on the team, I felt like I couldn't share it. But the truth is that uh, personal wins at work that you're going through or that you're achieving are actually positively impact others and the work that they are doing ultimately right it's something that is a little bit more on the energetic side being able to like imagine your colleagues being able to see that you're constantly celebrating there's something really magnetic about that and really positively impacting the team so don't run, don't really shy away from sharing those wins publicly with everyone that you kind of like know around you and some of the i, I wanted to give you kind of like a, a little template that i would use or that i would use to kind of like frame whatever i'm sharing as a win that way you have an idea of how to start crafting your own. So something that I would say, for example, going back that my safe space is a little bit more spoken and it's a little bit more in front of everybody else to create that visibility. I would say, okay, like this week I completed an essential task in the roadmap 24 hours before it was due. And it was such a win for me and the team because it allowed, it allowed for X or Y opportunity. Um, and I would like to do this again, or like whatever you want to add to that, right? It depends a lot on your on how you want to phrase things. But the main idea behind this is to actually start using those words of celebration. This is something that I achieved. This is something that allowed for this opportunity, kind of like measuring your impact a little bit more with those numbers or with what it allowed us to do. And um, at the beginning, it's gonna be it can be scary, but it's something that I, that's also why I recommend like crafting it at the beginning and then. Maybe trying it out the next time that you're doing one of these meetings with your colleagues. I love that uh, uh, input, Michelle. I think there's so many valuable takeaways here that we can uh, consider. And I think this is uh, such such great information that you're sharing. So thank you. Um, I want to pivot and, and kind of ask more in a one-to-one -one setting, what if we want to highlight a specific accomplishment to our managers in a one-on-one? -on -one? Uh, what does that kind of look like? How should we be approaching that? And maybe what are some questions that we can include or ask in, in conversations to bring up these topics? Yeah, absolutely. And I know that um, before I give my answer, I feel that there was a really good question around this last time, like in the previous call. So I wanted to address it as well. And that was the fact that sometimes, even though we have the wins, we really don't feel comfortable sharing it out loud with people because we're not used to 
talking about ourselves or talking about ourselves feel, feels icky or it feels nerve wracking. We feel some sort of way about talking about ourselves. So that is something to really keep in mind. So if you are already someone who feels like your main issue of not talking about these things is that the fact that you're just not used to getting, um, getting feedback and like accepting that and also kind of like talking about yourself and what you have accomplished, then um, my answer to that would be really going back to the first um, to the first exercise, which was the win list. The win list is already something that 99% of people don't do. So as long as you start doing that and creating a habit out of it, it can be actually really good for your confidence in showing up in this conversation. So I would say approaching it as a practice as well. And this is especially to you if you feel that you have a hard time just talking about yourself. Um, but now that I've said that, let's go back into the question, which was talking about your accomplishments with your one-on-one, -on -one, with your manager one-on-one, -on -one, right? So um, I was mentioning that one of the main issues that I've seen, I saw it in myself, I saw it in my, in my colleagues, I saw it and I see it now in my clients, is that a lot of people kind of like just leave the manager kind of like run wild and take over the one-on-one -on -one part. When in fact, if you remember when you first started working at GitLab or whatever company, they always tell you that the one-on-one -on -one time is actually a time for you to get some sort of support that you need right now. And so it's going to be really important for you to be able to make the most out of this conversation. However, if there's no boundaries or expectations in place, the managers will run wild during this conversation and will take it over. And that is not a fault on their own. I think that uh, managers are extremely busy people. So most likely they will always try to make it about work, right? Like they have so many goals, they're trying to do all these things. So it's kind of like on you to start leading slowly, but surely those calls a little bit more because they do affect what sort of opportunities you get in front of. And going back to visibility, right? Like managers tend to give more opportunities or put people for promotion who are more kind of like up in their face. They know what they're up to and so on, right? But sometimes they also don't put the, they don't put into place the system or the way to actually be in the know about what everyone is doing. So it's kind of like a broken system in a way. So that's why it's important for us to get a little bit more into like our leadership shoes and be like, okay, I'm going to be a leader in controlling at least my one-on-one -on -one space because it's important to me, right? And so um, I was mentioning as well that in my time at Amazon, for example, sometimes in my one-on-one, -on -one, I would be just talking and chit-chatting for 45 minutes about random stuff, not even work-related. And then 15 minutes before the end of the call, then she would just be like, oh, like, do you have anything for me, whatever? And then I'd be like, either I forgot or I would be too afraid to mention it now. And so I would be like, okay, so just let me recap what I've been doing for work. And then just, we kind of like call it a day, right? And then then you have those feelings after it, which is, I should have asked about this or I should have asked about my promotion. Like there's all these things that we normally have. So that is a telling sign. If you're right now, when you're going into one-on-ones and then you come out thinking like, oh, I should have, if it's starting with should have and something, there's something that there's, it's there to look at. So I'm going to try to help you with the next couple of things that I'm going to share. So going back to what should be happening in the one-on-ones is that, okay, there's a little bit of chit chat. It's an all remote work. So it's ideal to start creating that connection at a more human level. So chit chat is fine at the beginning. Doing problem solving. So normally if you have any challenges, any obstacles that you really want to help um, the help of the manager to get through. The second thing is planning. Even people skip planning a lot. Like it's not like they give you next steps and so on. It's kind of just, we discuss about a problem and we really don't have any way forward. And then the fourth thing is growth talk. So the growth talk is under, under that umbrella, you talk about your accomplishments. And so that is a space where there's a lot of opportunities, right? That is the opportunity for you to start talking about that visibility. So there are a few things to consider as well. So when I talk to people who have been in roles for a longer time, I've noticed that they feel that because their previous year or so has been really horrible one-on-ones where they haven't gotten anywhere, they don't have the visibility, they, they feel that they are not able to create new expectations. They feel that it's a little bit more out of their comfort zone. But I want to tell you that you can create expectations at any time. It's just a matter of really analyzing where things are and then doing and saying different things, we willing to have the conversation with your manager to open that kind of like channel of communication again. 
So I'm gonna walk you through how I would do that and how I taught others to do it. And the first thing is that, okay, so if you feel that your previous four to five one-on-ones have been kind of like not been helping you set up for success, then this is gonna be the exercise for you. So analyze your previous four to five one-on-ones. I want you to start looking if you have notes and start asking yourself some of the questions that I'm gonna be sharing. So just start noticing what are some of the topics that you tend to discuss the most? What is the reason behind you discussing those type of topics? Is it because you actually need the help or is it because you feel that you're just trying to fill up the space? Get really curious about all of this. Um, do the topics that you're talking about on the one-on-one, -on -one, do they feel aligned to you or are you having a lot of shoots after the call? And then um, what are some of the things that would feel more aligned for you to talk about? Those are, that's a, another question that I would ask myself. And now once you have gone through all these questions, if you identify something that you wanna change, it's about starting a new expectation with the manager. And so I would, I would share how I would say it um, very directly. And then I will give you another example. So the first thing it would be, okay, like if, my man, if I identified that we're not talking at all about my wins and my goal, sometime this year is getting promoted and I want that visibility, then I would say something like at the very beginning of my call, I would say, hey, Sarah, just I, I wanted to let you know that I'd love to start these one-on-ones to talk a little bit through about my wins and accomplishments around X project just to set the tone of our conversation. And it also helps me keep track of them. Does that work or would that work? And again, every time that we say something where we always ask a question at the end in, in a way to like open up the discussion and it doesn't feel like, you know, we're attacking them or anything like that. And I know there's also people who might be a little bit less direct or they feel like this might be a little bit threatening. I get all the actions that we're taking here normally should be things that you feel safe with Otherwise, you're not gonna do them. It just it just feels like a threat in the brain. So it just doesn't. It's not something that you're gonna do. So um, if you're a little bit less direct and that feels safer, then I would say, okay, like uh, I would just start using different wording as we're talking in your one on one. So in the one on one, I would say things like, okay, manager, name, whatever. This week I'm celebrating myself for being able to do this at this deadline, right? Or this was a this other thing that I did was a major win for me and the team. Um, and I'd love to be included in more work like that. That is a little bit more like opening up those conversations. And um, so those are the two examples, the direct and the less direct one. And the other thing to keep in mind is that I feel that sometimes there's a lot of assumptions in the way that that's why we end up not doing the things that we say that we will in those one-on-ones. And it happens because we assume that the manager will say no or that they won't like it. Or that if they say yes, you're just going to be talking about yourself and they're, they're secretly not going to like it, right? And um, something to keep in mind is that, like I mentioned earlier, your wins are everyone's wins. Like you're, you are kind of like putting that kind of like positive feedback into everybody else. So it's just something to keep in mind that if you, especially if you're thinking like, oh, they won't like it or I'm making an assumption in order for you not to take the action, it's something to keep in mind. It's like, okay, Michelle said that it, it positively impacts people. So I'm, I'm going to try it. So, and again, if they say no, which is a possibility, people can say no to things, right? That's their own boundary. Um, however, this is your space. So you, again, you get to be a leader and decide what that can look like. So um, if they do say no, I recommend that instead of like clamping up, which happens a lot when we hear no and being like, oh, this is the end of the world. I want to start looking for a new job. Um, we're actually going to reopen the conversation by brainstorming in ways that we can keep them still informed of the work that they're doing, that we're doing. So I want to give you an example because I feel that this might sound really hard. But this actually happened to one of my clients. So she actually ended up, okay, she was in tech, she was at PayPal, and she was under a manager who was a little bit more on the technical side. So he was actually like a senior engineer or something, but he was a manager. And 90% of his team were people technical, so they were all engineers. And then my client was under him as well, but she was a little bit less technical. So she felt that you know, the manager was very direct, very just focused on the action and so on. And when she started opening the conversation about, I really want to get promoted and all these things, I really want to start getting, giving you everything that, I, that you need for me to be put off for promotion. The manager actually said no, like very directly said no. And, that, and then he kind of like followed up saying like, oh, I know that you're doing such a good work. 
but that person we didn't really know that right and again this goes back to managers are super busy they're just about the action 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 and so it's on you to kind of like instead of when you hear no like just like close up open it back up again so when when he said that she was like okay well that was an expectation that she had after we had talked so she was like okay so let me so let's talk a little bit more about what that can look like like if you don't want that to happen in the one-on-one what is what is it that I can do for you to be informed and for me to you know see some kind of like good steps getting towards uh promotion in the next three months or so so then they started brainstorming right like people will barely say no to brainstorming they might say no to to a question that you have but if you're like let's brainstorm it's the human nature to just say yes so it's a little bit it opens back up that conversation so I would recommend that you do that so my, what my client ended up doing is that she ended up doing the less direct the less direct version that I gave you earlier so she started using more celebration words she started using more words of like this is my accomplishment and being a little bit more um, intentional with saying that and then after that, she was able to uh, agree with him to send him by weekly kind of like uh, status updates about what she was up to. And at the very end of that, she would just put like, kind of like, these are the things that I'm kind of like proud of this week that I achieved. And then you have that something in written, right? The, having something in written is super helpful because three months down the line, managers will be like, oh, you don't have anything to be promoted on. And then you'll be like, wait, I've been sending you emails for over three months. So let's go over those. And then again, you open that conversation again. It's all about really brainstorming ways to make it work for the both of you. Um, and so that is kind of how, like, how she decided to do it. And again, you have to make sure that it works for you. But these conversations, usually once they are being had, you start getting a little bit more comfortable in, in the flow of things and sharing your accomplishments there. Great. Thanks, Michelle. So I have one more question from Kyla and I, and then we'll move on to team member questions. So for anyone on the call, if you have any questions, feel free to add them to the document. Um, but this last question from me is, uh, there's a lot of people at GitLab who contribute to the company outside of their specific roles at GitLab. And I'd like to hear from you how we can connect accomplishments and contribute contributions that we make outside of our role to the work that we're doing in like whatever our title is at GitLab. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah. So um, I think the first and most important thing around this to know and to really kind of like let it sit kind of like in our bodies is that whatever we do outside of work positively impacts how we show up at work and vice versa. Right. We're ultimately, you know, we have a lot of things going on at work and outside, but they do overlap a little bit sometimes in terms of like the tools that we're using and the, the type of problem solving that we're doing. Right. So the key here is really tapping into the unique experiences that you have outside of work. That maybe you know projects that you're doing, maybe you have a business outside, maybe you volunteer for a nonprofit. All of those are things that really give you good tools that you can leverage in your role. And that is how you can make the connection. So I always like to give an example of, you know, a semi-pro athlete, right? Let's say that this semi-pro athlete is someone who didn't get into the pro. So that person decides to go back to a corporate company and that person gets hired and so on, right? So this is someone who outside of work has been someone who is used to a lot of training hours, is comfortable with a little competition, has a lot of grit, right? And that is just their personal experience of someone outside of work but this person can also decide when he's or she's in the work in the in the corporate job to make those attributes that he or she has to solve problems create insights and even provide examples and i want to tie it back for you now it is the same for you you have to be able to know that all of the things that you're doing outside of work give you tools and skills that will allow you to contribute and accomplish things at work and um the second thing to this is that don't really be afraid of bringing them in. A lot of people do like to make the distinction really clearly between work and outside. But here we're talking about we're doing something that, you know, we're taking the time to do it and so on. So it's not like we're mixing things. It's just we're taking tools from one place to another. And so that is how, that is how we connect this too. So going in and tying it back to visibility. I would say something around the, the following lines for me to be able to be known as someone who 
does something similar outside of work and it's part of kind of like our personal brand at work right and so I would say things like you know I did a very similar project before outside of work or in my volunteering even and it resulting in an x or y results and it taught me this one very big lesson and maybe this is something that we can try here at GitLab so you see it's kind of like tying back it's not really going back to the fact not focusing on the fact that you're doing something else outside of work it's focusing on the fact that you have a really valuable tool that you can use at GitLab. And so that's how you tie it in in terms of visibility as well. Yeah, thanks, Michelle. This has been a great conversation again. So I really appreciate <laughs> your insight. Um, we have one team member question in the doc so far, but I'm not sure who added it. Is the person who added it on the call and wants to voice it? Hi, yeah, I'm still here. This is Emily. Cool. Thanks, thanks, Michelle for being here. This is an awesome conversation. Um, so I just had a question um, about how to counter pushback against speaking confidently. I think maybe we all get signals around this probably in, in different ways. One signal I got, um, and I put an example here, for example, if we have an accomplishment in a certain area, we might speak confidently about that knowledge. I was given feedback that I should start suggestions with, oh, I probably don't know anything about this, but have you tried X? Even though I have expertise in the topic. Um, I'm sure I, I was at Amazon before GitLab, so I can remember instances there as well. So I would, I'm just curious, if you, you might be familiar with this. What do you suggest we do to counter this and prevent it in the future? Yeah, I think it's kind of similar to the other question that we got in the, on the previous one, which was, even though you have that, like the accomplishments everywhere and you have them, there's something kind of like between you and being able to share them outside, right? So my question for you would be, and I, I ask these questions just to allow a little bit more of like details. So for you, what are what is maybe like a time that you successfully did that? That I successfully pushed back? Mm -hmm. I don't know if I've successfully pushed back against <laughs> Yeah. When I was given that feedback, I was just like, oh, okay, I'll think about that. <laughs> yeah. And do you think about it? Like, what was your kind of like process of thought for it? I thought about um, adding a smiley face to every suggestion that I give. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not sure if that's worked yet. I'll let you know. <laughs> How um, long have you been doing that? Not very long. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I'm not sure. I guess it's different depending on who you're with um, yeah. and how you're feeling. So sometimes you might feel comfortable saying, um, <laughs> I don't know, um, just reiterating maybe your experience of like, well, I've done this a few times and it's worked really well. And I just want to make sure that I share that value with you. Yeah, so you exactly. could say something like that, I guess. Yeah, like that could be a start. It sounds like that feels a little bit safer for you. It feels like like a, like a, like a low hanging fruit, which is also mm -hmm. what we're, we're looking for in this. We just don't want to have what people call a, like a Beyonce thought, which is like, I'm a unicorn and I can do this and I'm super confident. It's kind of like getting the low hanging fruit. And it seems for you, you can maybe like base it a little bit more on like facts or you can just maybe if you feel more comfortable with that person, then you can do it then. And for other people, maybe you can adopt one that, that is a little bit more passive, like sending an email or something that feels a little bit safer for you to do. Um, but in general, something that I like to, to, I'm not sure who gave you the feedback, was it your manager? Um, I, I, it was probably someone that I work with. That's okay, okay. <laughs> like, it was just kind of like a suggestion, right? From their part? Yes. Okay, yeah. And sometimes when people ask you those type of questions, and then maybe either if you feel stuck or you feel really excited, it sounds like this time you feel like, oh, like, yeah, that could be it. I guess I could do that. But it didn't sound like it's something that you wanted to do. I'm guessing the reason is because, yeah, it didn't feel safe. So what I would have done is like maybe open it up a little bit more in terms of like, how can I get curious about this? What is something that I can do? Kind of like the low hanging fruit that I can do today that would feel a little bit more com comfortable for me and so that I can start doing a little bit more often. And again, because you're not going to do things that don't feel safe. And the second thing is that actually your idea of like putting smiley faces is really good. So even in my win list, even in my personal win list, I put the really emoji, the 
the celebrating one like is just like a bunch of like confetti everywhere and I do that because it feels like I'm actually celebrating it and it does take a little bit of practice like I said like it takes a few months to really start seeing the results in in your own confidence but it's just kind of like taking the small steps taking the most steps and knowing that they will build and come up with a big momentum there yeah what was that helpful let me know if not and we'll open it back up um, yeah, I guess I was also just wondering, like, when, when someone reacts negatively to you talking confidently, what do you do? Yeah, and that happens a lot in tech. That happened a lot to me. Um, it was just a lot of, like, having, uh, again, like, for me, I also tend to be a little bit more direct. So when people would say, like, I got a lot of, like, the, you're so aggressive when I'm talking about my own accomplishments. So I would be like, what is aggressive about it? Like, just getting really curious, right? It's not yeah. like immediately we get super feeling attacked it's just human nature but actually if you stand back a little bit and you're like oh like can I ask you something about it and they'll be like yeah like they'll be confused right and you can be like what does it feel aggressive about it versus you know maybe somebody else doing it if I just for me to understand a little bit more or for example if uh, I also had another instance where I was sharing kind of like my status updates with someone and then my manager intervened and she was like Oh yeah, it sounds like it's too much. Like I also hear too much a lot. Um, and so I would be like, what is it too much about it? Like, let's brainstorm about like, what is something that can feel better? And also that person seems to be, you know, receiving it well. Why do you feel that I should change it there, right? And so just kind of like have being willing to have that conversation helps at the beginning. And also when we're getting any sort of feedback it's really easy for us to make it about ourselves when in fact, sometimes it's about the person, right? Maybe it's a way for them to kind of like, be like, oh yeah, you should do that. And maybe they're not even doing it or maybe it's something that worked for them and then they just want to push it onto other people. And again, it's going back to what works for you and feel safest for you. Thank you, that was awesome, thanks. Yeah, hope, hopefully that helped. We have just about two more minutes. So I'll put it out there to see if anyone has a quick question to ask Michelle, otherwise we'll wrap it up. Cool. Well, I really appreciate your time, Michelle. This has been really great. Um, thanks for being open and honest with answering these questions. And I appreciate everyone who made time to be here on this call to learn from Michelle. Um, thank you for taking time to do that. So um, yeah, thank you. Yeah, for thank you so much for having me. We appreciate you <laughs> joining us today. Thanks everyone, take care. Bye y'all. Bye. Bye everyone, thank you. Bye.